Welcome to the Prepped and Polish podcast, the podcast that empowers you to take control of your education, featuring weekly interviews with influencers in the world of education, as well as tutoring tips, lessons, and updates. And now, here's your host, Alexis Avila. Hi, everyone. This is Alexis Avila of Prepped and Polished, a tutoring and test prep firm that provides in-person and online tutoring for all the tests and academic subject tutoring, such as math, science, English, languages, and study skills coaching. We work one-to-one always. For more information, please check out PreppedAndPolished.com. Also, make sure to go to www.PreppedAndPolished.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Get to know the Prepped and Polished community. You can find us on Facebook, Prepped and Polished, or go to Twitter, at Prepped Polished, and we're on Instagram, Prepped and Polished 1. To our listeners, you can submit a question at any time to radio at preppedandpolished.com. I love hearing from you. And I welcome you to the Prepped and Polished podcast, where we interview amazing and inspiring guests in the world of education, as well as offer tutoring and test prep tips, lessons, and updates. Our interview series continues right now with episode 66 with American journalist and New York Times bestselling author Frank Bruni. Frank is author of Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be, an antidote to the college admissions mania. Frank was chief restaurant critic of the New York Times from 2004 to 09. He's the author of two best-selling books, Born Round, a memoir about his family's love of food and his struggles with overeating and ambling into history about George W. Bush. In June 2011, he was named an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Frank received his undergrad from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and master's degree in journalism from Columbia. On today's episode, Frank talks about college admissions mania, the anxious parents of college-bound students, and why top-tier schools or alleged top-tier schools, we shall say, are rejecting even straight-A students. Frank Bruni, thanks for coming on the Prepped and Polished podcast. How are you today? I'm good. I hope you're good, too. Doing well. First, just a quick fun question. I'm a, bi- I'm a big foodie, and I've been writing a food blog a day in the bite for a couple years. And uh, I wanted to quickly ask you what, uh, how you enjoyed your times as a New York Times food critic, uh, and did restaurateurs get nervous when you came to their restaurant? And, uh, um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, it was I did it for five and a half years. I was ready to stop when I stopped, but when I was doing it, it was a it was a terrific adventure. And yes, if restaurant if restaurateurs knew that you were in their restaurant, they got <laughs> visibly nervous. Yes. Okay. And how was your transition to the op ed columnist from from the food critic, and and how or how come the transition? Well, food critic was the anomaly, not op ed columnist, because I was I was someone who covered politics and foreign affairs and all sorts of newsy stuff for years before I um, became the restaurant critic. In fact, when I when I was chosen to be the restaurant critic, I was uh, finishing up two years as our Rome bureau chief, our Rome correspondent. And I was in that job. I was doing things like going to Israel all the time to help out there, Turkey, et cetera. So it was not such a difficult transition to make into the op-ed columnizing because I was kind of going back to the subject matter I'd spent most of my career covering. Gotcha. And tell us about your, your new book that came out, uh, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be, and what motivated you to write it? Um, I've been watching uh, nieces, nephews, uh, friends, kids go through the college admissions process over these last couple of years, and uh, it was just taking me aback how much anxiety the process was whipping up, how crazy people were getting about it. Um, the machinations used to get into schools, the magnitude of heartbreak when you didn't get into the school you wanted to, the the plunging acceptance rates at the top schools. And as I watched all of that, I thought, you know, we're we're giving a lot of these kids who are uh, at least privileged enough to have some choices, we're giving them the message somehow um, that the exclusiveness, the selectiveness of the school they get into is going to have a profound and lasting trajectory on their whole lives. And that just didn't square with what I saw around me in terms of, you know, when I've interviewed successful people, the successful people I just happen to know, they have all kinds of educational backgrounds. Some went to fancy schools, some went to state schools, Mm -hmm. some went to schools you never heard of, you know. And I felt like we weren't giving this generation of kids an accurate 
uh, picture of the world, and the inaccurate picture we were giving them was whipping them into needless anxiety. Parents come to me uh, overwhelmed by the college process, and the landscape is competitive, and as you're saying, it creates anxiety. My question for you is, has college application anxiety been a problem for a long time, or is this a newer problem? It's been a problem for a long time. I mean, there was a lot of anxiety in the process when I went through it in the early 80s. What's changed is, is, is it's become much, much more severe. You know, so okay. when I was applying, my peers and I, we were all you know, very, very conscious and self-conscious about what was going on, and we, and we certainly were nervous. But it was nothing like today. I mean, we didn't have, now there's a whole industry for, for people of means. There's a whole industry of private admissions coaches to kind of help sure. you plot your high school career so that it looks the most impressive to an admissions committee. The right. test prep industry is a behemoth unlike anything when I was growing up. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is new, and it's, 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 it's made this much, much more intense than it ever was before. Yeah, definitely. In a recent uh, New York Times article you wrote, uh, you mentioned that a, a quarter century ago, roughly 20% of applicants to Yale were offered admission. Now it's about 6% were accepted. Yep. What's been the cause of this uh, dramatic dip in acceptances? Well, some uh, Yale and schools like it are, um, are making themselves known to and reaching out to and drawing applications from more kinds of people than ever, ever before. In some cases, that's good, because in some cases it means kids from less privileged circumstances, kids from areas of the country that maybe weren't kind of aware of the possibilities of a Yale education, et cetera. So it's partly a larger applicant pool um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a good sense, but in a sense that makes it more competitive. It's also, uh, it's also international students. Um, more of them apply uh, and oh, more yeah. of them get in, and that reduces the number for American kids. Um, and uh, I mean, so all of, all of these things have, have brought that acceptance rate ever lower. Gotcha. Um, now, is there value to the U.S. News and World Report rank rankings, or has it done more harm than good in the way it ranks well, colleges? There's some value to it, because okay. to, to produce those rankings, they, they gather a lot of information sure. um, that is, that is, you know, it's, it's helpful for students to be able to kind of access that school's profile and see for certain things. Okay. But I think it's done more harm than good because a lot of the things they're measuring, schools can manipulate. Um, you know, they can, schools can make sure they're doing certain things that are going to uh, please the U.S. News formula. And a lot mm. of the things U.S. News and World Report is measuring have nothing to do with the quality of instruction at the college. And so mm. people look at that ranking and they draw conclusions from it that aren't fair conclusions to draw because a high ranking doesn't mean this place is a theater of amazing education. It means the place has a lot of money and mm. it means the place has a great reputation but it doesn't really tell you a lot about whether that reputation is deserved. Definitely. Now, has the number of colleges students applied to increased over the years? And if so, why are they applying to so many schools? Um, it's increased markedly, uh, and they're applying to so many schools for two reasons, one of which is it's easy uh, uh -huh. if you've got the application fees because of a common app and because of the computer era. You know, when I was applying, I remember using an elect electric typewriter, and I had you know, to fill in different things for different schools. Um, nowadays, you know, there are supplements that each school may ask for to the Common App, but most schools will take the Common App. And so if you've got the money to apply, if, you, if you've got another $60 or $90 for another application fee, it's not an enormous amount of work to apply to 15 schools. It used to be much more work. So they're applying to more schools for that reason, but also as the acceptance rates drop and as the panic sets in, they're applying to more schools because they figure, you know, the more darts I throw at the board, right. uh, the better the chances I'm going to hit the bullseye with one of these darts. Exactly, yeah. Now, if you're a perfect student, you got straight A's, top SAT scores, you got the extra currics, great recommendations, are you a shoe in for a top-tier school? No, you're not a shoe in for it. Well, it depends on your definition of top-tier. Um, which is not a phrase I really like, but, okay. but I, I, I appreciate why you're using it. Um, you're not a shoe in no. Um, you the are alleged top tiers. Yeah. You're, you're guaranteed to get admission to a damn good school, and you're guaranteed, you're guaranteed sure. to get admission to a, a school that's going to have the possibility of a great education because you can get a great education at a range of schools and a number of schools you know, well beyond uh, the alleged top tier. But no, there are very few guarantees when it comes to, if we're talking about those schools like Yale, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton that have acceptance rates well below 8%, mm -hmm. 
um, there's really no such thing as a guarantee. Now, why do legacy students get admitted at a higher rate than non-legacies, and has this always been the case? It has always been the case. It may not, uh, it may not even be as bad as it once was. Um, mm-hmm. Legacy students are given um, slightly or majorly preferential treatment. It's often based on the family's um, financial profile. Um, because in many cases, uh, their parents, grandparents, whoever, whoever is the source of the legacy, um, has given money to the school, and schools care about alumni giving. It's an, it's an, enormous, it's an enormous part of their finances and their endowment. Mm. And so they essentially, those, those alumni uh, have created a sort of IOU, and the school owes them. But also, um, I think it's sort, of like, it's sort of like any loyalty club member. You know, it's not that different from being a frequent flyer. You want to you want to solidify the bond with a loyal, proven customer. Sure, sure. And I'm not sure. Is there a way for them to keep track of which alumni has given money back to the school? Um, of course. Okay. Because <laughs> yes. all right, I, I wasn't sure. I was just curious because, like, I went to Michigan and I haven't given them a dollar back. Don't tell them, but somebody um, there knows that. Okay. Somebody there knows that. Interesting. All right, so. In your interview on PBS, um, you mentioned that getting into Arizona State's Honors College can be just as good an education as getting into, say, a Harvard. Is this an example of what those U.S. news rankings don't tell you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, A lot of state universities have um, honors programs, special programs that are just extraordinary. Um, But since U.S. News is just looking at at the whole of the school, and it's not, it's not able to make any sort of discriminating judgment about the particular road at that school you're taking, the rankings can't capture it. It's, it's, it's one of the, that's a good example of one of the many, many flaws of the rankings. Wow. Now, what tips do you have for a, a hard-working high school student with good, solid grades who aspires to get into a good college and get a great education? My tip is to pay a lot less attention uh, I don't have tips on how to get in because I mean I, I could I could come up with some for you, but my message is we need to talk a lot less about how to get in, and we need to talk about how to use college. So um, my tips have nothing to do with gaining admission because that's kind of antithetical to where I think we should be spending our energies. My tips are once you determine where you're going, you know, based on where you wanted to and who took you, pause and spend as much time looking at what that college or university offers and thinking about how you're going to reap the most you can there. Spend as much time, thought, and energy on that as you do at filling out applications, because in the long run, the way you use your college education, what you got from your college education, is going to be much more relevant to your contentment and your success than whether that institution had a gleaming fancy name. Definitely. And are there any good resources out there for students who want to learn about these hidden gems, like these solid schools? There, 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 are, there are a couple. Uh, the one that springs instantly to mind um, is uh, an organization that sprang from a very popular book uh, called Colleges That Change Lives. Um, and if kids Google it and look at it, it, it it's, it's a constantly refreshed, updated list of schools that aren't always mentioned breathlessly, you know, uh, by, by, by kids, but that have um, very, very special programs, have um, special climates for learning. And there, there are books beyond that. I mean, if you Googled um, uh, colleges uh, beyond the norm, or I mean, I'm not sure exactly what phrase you'd use, but I mean, I've certainly sure. seen books come across my desk at the New York Times because I write just enough about higher education that I'm on a lot of these lists. I've seen books come across my desk that are uh, meant to be kind of pushbacks to U.S. News and Report, that kind of thing, that talk about colleges, um, you know, more creative college choices. And that Colleges That Changed Lives book is good. I, I have that one. That's a good choice. It's you, terrific. It's also just terrific, the whole concept of it. I think it sends a very important message, you know, that that schools schools are much more than the, than the currency of their name. Speaking of message, you were quoted recently as saying, um, and, and bear with me, uh, we have to help kids and families and society put college admissions in perspective. We must change the conversation uh, from where I got in to what I'm going to do. 
And then you say, yep. if, we, if we spend as much time and energy on the subject of maximizing the college experience, wherever the college, whichever the college, as we do on sorting and ranking schools by exclusive, exclusiveness and prestige, we'd be doing everyone an enormous favor, and we'd be doing society enormous good. My question for you is, where are we in this conversation and are we still in the danger zone where everyone's panicking with unrealistic expectations or are families making better choices already? Uh, I think we're still in the panic mode. I think okay. families are not, I don't think, I don't think enough families are making better choices. Um, I think it's really, really hard for them to break free of this because, uh, it's, you know, par- parents want the best for their kids. Um, and that's, uh, that's great. Um, and they should, and they should try to get the best for their kids. And I, I think we've been living for more than a decade now um, in a period of great economic pes- pessimism and anxiety about the country's place in the world, about whether our economy is going to grow enough to to afford the next generation, the quality of lives that, that the current you know, generation has. All of this stuff is making parents want to look for any leg up they can give their kids. And I think they believe, with some reason, um, that a an elite exclusive institution could be a leg up. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's hard for them to break through of that anxiety. Um, we in the media feed it by writing, um, by writing breathless stories about plunging acceptance rates. Um, so it's, it's a difficult conversation to change. And I think if it's going to change, and I very much hope it will, we're right at the beginning of that. Okay. Good to know. Um, and to, to the kids or teens listening to the podcast today, any advice before they cross that bridge into college and, and young adulthood? Yeah, I think they need to I think they need to remember and really 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 remember this that that a college education if it's something within their uh intellectual reach if it's something within their financial reach if it's if it's a part of the plan of the if it's part of part of the life plan that they can execute is an extraordinary privilege and opportunity and adventure um, regardless of what that college's acceptance rate is. Um, and there is just a bevy of colleges that can give, and universities that can give you an extraordinary education as long as you insist on that education, as long as you take an active role in making it happen for yourself, as long as you make, make a point of figuring out what your environment can offer and getting the best of it. Think about all of that stuff. Focus on all of that stuff, and you will be okay regardless of where you got in. Awesome. Frank, thanks for joining us on the Prepped and Polished podcast. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. And this wraps up our show today with American journalist and New York Times bestselling author Frank Bruni. To read Frank's articles, please visit the New York Times and buy his book, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. You can pick it up at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And check out episode 67. We'll be doing our next tutoring tips episode. And if you like to cook good food, don't forget to say hi to me on my food blog at dayinthebite.com. Thank you for joining us on the Prepped and Polished podcast. Now go out there and take control of your education. You've been listening to the Prepped and Polished podcast. For more information, check out preppedandpolished.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Class dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.